Everyone thinks architecture is a math-heavy field, and in everyday practice, you're really only using very basic math. But as I compare that to sketching and drawing, you know, I sketch every day. So I'm often asked, what are the best things I can do in high school or college to prepare me for architecture school? And I always return to the advice of learning to draw and learning to sketch as absolutely essential skills for anyone interested in architecture. Learning to draw is just learning to see. Even though we have digital tools to produce the final documents and drawings, the analog sketchbook, pencil and paper, they're still relevant. So let's talk about what my daily habits are, how I might use the sketchbook in practice. I do most of my sketching with a mechanical pencil, and my current favorite is the 0.5 millimeter Kuru Toga with HB lead, and I can vary the line weight just by changing the pressure on the tip. If you want really heavy lines, you can always switch to a thicker pencil or a softer lead. Here I'm laying out four quick elevation studies, and I keep them small so that they're quick to draw, and I'm just blocking out ideas. And for these, it's really just about what's solid and what's open. I usually shade the open glazed areas a little bit darker to show that contrast. Don't be afraid to keep source material out and on your desk to give you ideas and to spur on your creativity. This book was made specifically for typographers, but it's full of dynamic and interesting grid layouts to help you with your compositions and keep things ordered. So much of sketching is about resolving proportions, and I use the dot grid on the page to help keep me on track. You can see I start out by using really light strokes, quick, imperfect lines, and then I start to darken things up as I make decisions. Below the elevations, I start by sketching out equally crude floor plans, just lines and blocks, that's all. We're always switching back and forth between plan and elevation because what works in one may not work in the other, and working on them together ensures we don't take a design too far in floor plan, say, that doesn't work in elevation. Once these are roughed out, I'll choose one to bump up in scale and begin to layer on more detail. For this particular sketch, I am starting to think a little bit about the layout. So I know I want to draw the side elevation here of this little cabin, and I also want to draw the front elevation. So I'm starting on the left side of the page, and I'm just starting by drawing information that I know. So some of the site context, you can see that there's sloping topography, and I'm just starting to rough in what that is. And all sketches, really for me, begin with this light line work. So you'll notice that everything has a sameness to it as the sketch begins and then as it starts to kind of bloom on the page we start layering in different line weights so adding shading we're going to add heavier line weights there is this feedback loop that happens as you're drawing things you're thinking about the site and you're thinking about materials and structure and you know fenestration and climate and winds and rain and all these things they start to inform the drawing um, at various times. So as I'm drawing the layout for the site here and the topography changes, I'm thinking, okay, uh, you know, if I'm going to be bearing on this granite, how do I actually attach to it? And what does that look like? And does it want to feel open and exposed? Or do I want to close that in with some screening? Um, so some of this may seem superfluous. Like I don't have to draw the rocks in the topography. I don't have to draw the smoke coming out of the chimney. But for me, it's kind of about setting a stage for the sketch. And these contextual elements help inform how the design may react to them. So here I'm just drawing little pockets of soil in between the rocks. You know, the reality of the topography here is that there is some exposed granite and then there's also these patches of lichen and mosses and low bush blueberry. And so all of that can start to, you know, find its way into the sketch and start to inform maybe the materials, maybe the shingles that I'm choosing to use for the wall, maybe the colors. It's just all part of how the sketch begins to build itself. So here I'm drawing the front elevation of this, the one that faces the water side. And here, all I'm doing is dividing it up. So there's some proportional games that you can play. I'm dividing this facade into thirds. So I know I want to be supporting it at the third points. And then I'm going to come in back in and start layering on some fenestration. Fenestration is just windows and doors. I'm moving slowly because it just allows me to think and process, you know, working at the computer. People always say, oh, it's just way more efficient to work in the digital environment and that may be true but that does not necessarily always yield the best results and there is this kind of feedback loop that happens from the page back up to the brain that uh, is hard to replicate i've found in digital space so that's why just moving slowly and methodically in the sketching environment is just a nice break from that nice reprieve 
I'm just starting to fill in textures and information. Um, starting to maybe thinking about a little window up in this loft space, just roughing in some shingles. Now I'm going to throw in some context. So in the background of this, I know it's a wooded site. And so I'm just going to start filling in some of the detail on the trees. And this just helps kind of again, set it in the place. Sketching trees is one of the really great exercises you can use to practice your technique um, of observing things because drawing is really seeing. And if you go out and look at the trees in your local neighborhood and really look at them with an artist's eye and think about how you could replicate their actual look, it'll help you to see actually what's there and maybe not what you thought was there. So here I've just got these black spruces, which have these little tufts of needles very close to the top, and they have a very distinct shape to them. Oftentimes they're flagged by the wind. So I'm just filling that information to kind of set these two elevations compositionally next to each other. So I'm looking at two views here. You can see I've, I'm adding in some tie rods and Again, some more site information. You can see on the deck to the left side of the sketch, I've added a little sort of scale figure to give an idea of, you know, how a person might feel standing next to this structure. And here I'm just filling in these little sort of, sort of soil pockets. Mm -hmm. You can see the textures are starting to build up. And now I want to set the background a little bit further back. And here still everything has a sameness to it. So the line weights are, are very similar. And we want to work to start to start to differentiate these things here. I'm just adding maybe some light elements that will work to illuminate the deck that's standing out front. And I'm not really happy with the way this looks. So I'm coming back with my little electric eraser and retooling this a little bit. I removed the window up in the loft area. Uh, it wasn't sitting right with this composition. But again, you know, you could treat this as rough and, and not worry about... Um, making those alterations in a simple sketch like this. Here. This just indicates sliding door panel. And you can start layering on all of this information, things like annotations and arrows, add some descriptors. So here I'm coming back and shading in the windows a darker shade. And this is starting to make things pop. You can see, you can start adding shade and shadow to really build depth in these sketches. And I like to shade the doors and windows, anything that's glazed, I like it to be the darkest thing on the page. I love this idea by Austin Kleon, where he talks about technology and this idea that technology is not just whatever is new. Technology is about carefully selecting the right tools for the job. You know, books can be seen as a great technology. A pencil is a great piece of technology. A sketchbook is a great piece of technology. And there are limits to what you can do. And it's those limitations that are good because any designer will tell you that when you can do anything, it can be difficult to know what to do next. The constraints of slow technology, like you know pencil and paper, they kind of force us to move slowly. And I think that's a good thing. Now the word drawing is both a noun and a verb. There's the making of the drawing, and then there's the physical object you're left with, the drawing. The act of drawing, the verb, that's where all the learning happens. The sketchbook has been months in the making. I talked about it being in production in early 2019, and I'm so glad to finally be able to get it in your hands. It has all the things I look for in a good sketchbook. It's ultra portable. The paper is 70 pound stock, heavy enough to stand up to both ink and pencil. The dot grid helps to guide and scale your sketches, but it's subtle enough that it doesn't dominate them. The corners are rounded to prevent damage, and the lay-flat wire binding works for both righties and lefties. The heavyweight chipboard covers have a debossed benchmark emblem and a reminder to go make things. The elastic closure keeps it all together in your bag, and it also serves as a placeholder. I couldn't have made them without Mike Shiano and his company Airship Notebooks. Thank you, Mike. He patiently listened to all my critiques and navigated all the tweaks I wanted to make along the way. They come as a pair, and there are limited quantities available, so be sure to grab them while you can and start building your sketching habit today.